it's uh, ironic or not that the, uh, the reminder that uh, order is essentially cognitive and it's in the mind should come from the uh, village example. And uh, I think it's also great that uh, all three, I'm hardly going to argue against this as an anthropologist, that all three uh, papers essentially are going for ethnography uh, as, uh, against, as against, uh, against numbers. Um, and uh, that, you know, as Suzanne showed so much, uh, we, if we want to understand anything, we have to look, look at what's going on under the radar, as it were, in, in, in a non-official or uh, uh, backstage kind of contexts. So uh, the floor is now open. We've got a decent amount of time for conversation and discussion. Who would like, who would like to go first? Don't be shy. And perhaps you could identify yourself. Um, I'm Eric Swingedow, University of Manchester. I have a question for the last speaker. Um, what Clive Barnett does in his fantastic book is, of course, the old trick, which is to articulate questions of equality and emancipation in terms of justice. And then you always hit the uh, impossible conversation about universality, partial universality, etc., which is inherently bound over the whole history, complex history of the concept of justice. So I was wondering whether we should not ditch the concept of justice and its convoluted discussion that we've had for two centuries and more, and replace it or bring back the political notion of equality, which is a very different notion than justice. Equality is always positioned and partial, but stands for a universal, although it's never universalizing. Take, take the history of any emancipatory struggle, whether it's working class struggle, feminist struggle, subaltern struggles, but always done not in the name of justice, they were sometimes legitimized in the name of justice, but expressed the desire to fight for the equality. It's always partial. It's someone's equality against someone else's uh, uh, um, mechanisms of unequal disempowerment. So if we think of it from that perspective, isn't it the case that any political struggle articulated around equality is disruptive, is disorderly? Is that what undermines, perverts, uh, um, um, erodes? the existing order, which is always, in a certain way, oligarchic and in egalitarian, as all our urban theories tell us. So I want to have your, your opinion on, 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 on what, we, what would happen if we slightly shift the argument that Barnett is making articulated on justice, shift it to a political notion of equality as always partial and situated, and in its enactment, always disruptive, of an always inegalitarian existing social urban order. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, um, I'll answer that quickly because uh, when I saw you sitting there and that I knew that I was uh, citing Clive Barnett, I knew immediately that you were going to come after me to um, argue for Clive here. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. Um, First of all, because what I have tried to do was not to make an argument around justice or equality, which I'm really ha happy to discuss that afterwards with you, but what I, I shamelessly perhaps did was to borrow his distinction um, around how we can think about normative concepts differently. And I thought that was what would be helpful for our discussion here today. So I, I, you know, I can have a lot of thoughts around should we focus on justice and justice, equality and equality, the political in different ways, etc. But I would say that that's now outside of the scope of this panel. So I'm happy to discuss with you at lunchtime. Sandra Dravchelovich, LSC. I have a question that could be first to any of you, really, and it's about the tension between order and disorder, and how do we square that tension. It seems to me that, and I take the argument that probably disorder is the, the fact of the contemporary city more than anything that we could try to understand or define as order. But having worked and lived in territories of tremendous disorder, 
and know that human beings cannot cope with it if it goes to its extreme and radical conclusion. So while we can have imaginations that enable free movement or you know, unexpected or spontaneous situations that probably the panel, the parallel panel is discussing, I think that when thinking of cities, we need to square some kind of balance or some, or at least address the tension between order and disorder. So I was interested in how do you see that tension and how would you square that? Um, I, I think um, it's not so much about squaring the tension, I think it's about being much more analytic about the tension. So I'll give you a, a kind of a, a proxy scenario. Um, I think if we had to look out of the city and, and if we had to look more explicitly at migration, you could say that there's an inherent paradox. There's a consistent production of inconsistencies. Um, in how we define migration, in how the capitalist system requires it, in how the political system refutes it. And I think this innate tension in capitalism and its political economy between the politics and the economics, the pretense that the one is, the politics is equitable, it's about the brightest and the best, it's about making a world-class city, and on the other hand, um, a kind of economics which is there innately to reduce the majority of our citizens to being insignificant. I think we have to work much more closely um, with that tension, and I think in that lens, maybe the question of um, injustice is a much more productive thing to focus on the injustice. And I think injustice relates much more to the discussion of equality and inequality. I think, I think we could unpack a whole lot of planning legislation that really take seriously this notion of the consistent production of inconsistencies in order to push some people up and explicitly push other people down. Sorry, it's quite a convoluted answer, but I think, I think there's a kind of a philosophical attitude to, to it in a way, rather than squaring, squaring it all. So just pick up um, from Susie and this discussion as well is uh, interesting. Um, so in, in terms of mobilizing to protect these uh, very precious streets and the activities that go on there, I think the difficulty is uh, exactly around these tensions of what, what is the politics of the contestation that's involved. And it's not just about making a global city and global finance, but about how you fund the welfare state. So in that context, um, you know, I, the outcome of our research project is that just looks like the city is being eaten up, not to fund financialized pension schemes, but to pay for us, <laughs> pay for our social care, pay for our schools, pay for um, the children's uh, uh, adoption processes, children in care, and so on. So in that case, how, how do you place um, the value of these streets alongside programs of housing delivery and um, funding the core functions of the local state? Um, so what, what sort of move is there possible? I mean, the one move is that the politics should be translated to a new location that is not about defending the street, but about changing how the city is, how the welfare state and urban processes are funded. So that's my conclusion, is that the debate is about where we find ourselves from and should we be funding it by eating up the city and these streets, particularly because they're going to be extraordinarily vulnerable as the business rates kick in as a source of local government funding. So um, you know, I'm thinking, how do you move that story on? Um, you know, what purchase do these community groups have. I mean, I know well the politics of trying to bring this forward, but exactly how could they be protected in face of these changes, which can't be stylized in some old-fashioned way? Yeah, I mean, can I jump into that? Um, infinitely pay into the pocket. Um, Peck and Riley, the rates that are generated from that street are far higher than the rates generated by Westfield Stratford. 
and yet it's Westfield Stratford that receives billions of pounds of infrastructure funding in order to set it up in the first place. So purely from capitalist economics, the street outpaces many of these developments, these theme parks, these shopping centres, that are heralded as success stories. Um, and it's because we have such a short-term view that the success story is something that can be delivered in five years and capitalised really quickly. From a much longer-term perspective, from the perspective of welfare, um, these streets provide work in parts of cities where there is increasingly less and less work to citizens that are less and less likely to find jobs. And I think that is absolutely elemental to the conversation. Aside from all of the kind of social work that many of these proprietors do because they're seeing people come in every day or every week and they're attending to all sorts of psychologies and emotions in that process. I think, I think the kind of understanding of work and the nature of localised work in poor parts of cities needs to be taken on much more seriously. Um, and I don't want to romanticise the, the, the nature of this work either. I know that these streets are full of all kinds of complex economies, but they nonetheless have some kind of validity in a world in which the peripheries are being stripped out. Kind of hidden racism there, the, the kind of people that we, uh, undoubtedly, 
Absolutely. I just wanted to get that out there. Yeah, absolutely. You didn't actually it's say absolutely it explicitly. Absolutely elemental to um, looking at something and understanding whether, on the basis of aesthetics or phenotype, something is valuable or not valuable. Uh, is it on this on this point? point? Okay, go ahead. Yes, I was intrigued by your example in this context of the Sudanese guy who was first in Amsterdam and was confronted with all manner of rules and regulations and then came to the UK, uh, where they could just open shop, so to speak. Now, I live in Amsterdam at, at the moment, and if I look at, you're absolutely right, the rules and regulations of entry or, or renders, but isn't it the case that m much of those, many of those regulations are exactly there? to offer the opportunity of this highly diverse urban tissue to make it possible for unemployed people, people who are on social benefits to open a shop without paying taxes, the reduced delays, etc. That comes with a big bureaucratic structure, but produces this extraordinary Jane, Jacob, Jane Jacobs type heterogeneity that we all value. Berlin is exactly the same. So we should not underestimate a, the role of what local planning and policy making can do, and the importance of strict regulations and control so that those who are systematically excluded in our pretty city centers, we all look the same, are actually able to stay. But that of course means some sort of order and control in order to make that happen, as cities like Amsterdam and Berlin demonstrate. And I, I think that's really interesting, Eric, and I'd be intrigued to know whether that, that kind of um, very layered planning system also serves to protect the people when the round of gentrification comes. I and mean, I, think, I think that is interesting. I think my point about uh, the person who had to move um, from Somalia to the Netherlands to the UK is, is that there is sometimes a vocabulary to planning regulations that makes it inordinately difficult for the outsider to enter into the system. So Hiran had to prove that he had um, a business plan, had to have six months saving in the bank, and he had to also prove that he wasn't going to, his business wasn't going to adversely affect other businesses in the area. And then on top of it, he had to sit down with an aesthetics committee so that his particular Somalian identity could be smoothed out to an Amsterdam identity. So there are peculiar um, swings and roundabouts here. And I'm also aware that the ability to set up shops simply with enough money for the first month's rental in the poorest parts of UK cities can also lead to incredible um, forms of exploitation. There was a question at the front here? No, no? no? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I just wanted to come back to the um, Brazilian uh, village <laughs> and the city um, and wonder a little bit about um, if you could elaborate a little bit on how the city and the village is connected. So you mentioned people have moved, you know, obviously gone back and forth to the, the city. And then we have a story about emergent ordering, which are very embedded in the practices of people. And I'm, I'm just wondering uh, you know, how to connect those two uh, stories. Yeah, and I, mean, I think increasingly the city becomes part of, of, of an order that you know, previously did not, did not include the city. Um, what connects them really is, is material goods. Um, sorry. <laughs> what connects them really is uh, mater material goods, which is the main reason why you would go to the city. What's very striking, though, is that when it comes to sort of ethics and morality of how it is to live well, what it is to live well, the city then doesn't play a role at all. So people might go to the city and spend some time that today nobody has actually taken the move to go and live in the city. Um, in other words, you go to get stuff there, but you wouldn't actually want to live like people in, in the city. Um, spatially, of course, movement between and going backward and forward, and indeed people from the city coming to the village to, to visit, um, or sometimes to do building work, all kinds of things. Um, spatially, the, 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 the city does now feature as part of, of, of the landscape, if, if you like. Um, but, but I guess in, in all of this, you know, thinking about order and, and disorder, um, uh, I, I suppose what we might want to do is kind of think about the difference between these sort of totalised models and these kind of partial models. And disorder, in a way, 
you know, we, we can rethink it in terms of a sort of um, emergent form of order. I'm, I'm not convinced that sort of saying it's not order, it's disorder is a solution to the problem that, that we're perhaps grappling with. Um, they seem to me to be aspects of, of a single problem. Can I just ask a clinical yeah. question about, about the village, which is, is it, what percentage of people in the village have actually spent time in the city? I mean, are there people who have never been to the city still, who, who have no idea yeah. what it's like? There's young, really young kids um, who, if they hadn't been ill, wouldn't have been to but the, the city. But, but among the adults, everybody has been at some time or other. Yeah, probably pretty much. Yeah. So there's nobody who's ignorant or... Ignorant. Or, or, uh, no. There's no one who's despised the going Oh, you've never been? No, no. I mean, another aspect to this, and that also fits with, with this question of order and disorder and, and things I think you've been talking about, is this sort of question of visibility and invisibility. One of the problems of the city is that it's an invisible space. Because people leave on a plane or now by car. Um, they go off and they do stuff there that nobody sees. Then they come back with loads of things. Which nobody knows where they got them from. Um, whereas the, the, the point, in a sense, about uh, the, the, the village, what allows you to live well, is this sense of the visibility of, of daily practice. You can see what other people are doing. Um, and you can you, you then take steps sometimes to you know, make sure that nobody can see what, what you're doing. And so on. But the idea that social life is visible, I think, is, is important. It talks about that question of walls that we were hearing about this morning. Perhaps to some questions about walking. Yeah, do, do you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, go ahead. I, uh, I was hoping that I hadn't given a, an idea that there was, that maybe I self, set myself up for that criticism exactly uh, of the binary between the order and disorder. I, I guess that's my, my own doing. Uh, I think the, the idea of focusing on, on disorder was that about the multiple experiences that we have about our daily, daily life. I mean, and the search for some form of order comes from feeling that something is out of place, out of order, you know, out of line, whatever that might be. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that if someone decided to marry into their clan, that would be a massive you know, problem of the established order in this Panaranian uh, uh, town. So I think my, my, and maybe goes back to the tension between order and disorder, or how do we square that? I think what I'm trying to say is, look, our, if we start from what are our experiences, what, are, what is it that we are trying to move into in which, what state we need to account to the different ways in which we are experiencing our everyday life and whether what might be order to me might be disorder to someone else or there might be different levels of, of that, whatever that is. But ultimately I guess we can't really get out of, of that uh, dichotomous somehow language that you know, goes back and is it justice in or injustice? Is it equality or inequality? Is it disruptive or not disruptive? And I think we end up uh, lacking the actual language to speak about something else that, uh, that is dark. So anyway, just but I, I uh, think, I think Well, I, if I could follow up on that, I mean, sure. it, seems, it strikes me that I think you've persuaded us, and I, I think we've independently come to that same conclusion that you can't obviously study order without disorder, and actually I think the, 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 the burden of your presentation is that actually it's easier to look at the disorder side of things because that's when people get upset. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of, you know, you know, kids are getting killed by knife crime all the time in London, but it's when the statistics hit a certain level, suddenly you know, people say, hey, more people have died in London than in New York this year, then suddenly it becomes an issue and people have to start kind of dealing with it. So it's when that level... Um, when, 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 when it becomes really disruptive. And people learn to live with it. People learn to live with all kinds of levels of disorder. To go back to one of your examples, where, where I work in Nepal for 10, 15 years, they were rolling what they call load shedding, in other words, power cuts, and there was a timetable. And people knew, and the people could have an app on your iPhone saying, telling you when the electricity was going to come back on to remind you to quickly go and plug everything in while you still have a few hours of electricity. So people adapt. 
we will adapt and live with those levels of that level of uh, disruption. And then it becomes some form of order. Then it becomes a form of order, exactly. So the two things can't be disrupted. Okay, we've got okay. anybody else want final thoughts from anybody? We've got two minutes, but if not, we'll go for lunch. Okay, thank you very much. Really interesting panel. Thank you.